Tim Cox from Kimber to speak to us on the human body designed by God. Good afternoon everyone. A few years ago, brothers and sisters, interested friends, I came across Sorry, uh, I came across um, this information uh, at a trip to Dudley Zoo that I went with my family a few years ago, which sort of gave me the inspiration for this, this talk this afternoon. And the, and the slide you see tells us that uh, chimpanzees and humans share 98.4% DNA. This they claim, scientists and evolutionists, the idea that rather than being designed by God humans, evolved from chimpanzees and scientists tell us that because we are so genetically similar to apes then we must have evolved from apes um, you can see on the slide that when we look at dogs cows and cats we are all over 90 percent similar genetically and that's not really surprising and actually supports the idea that God designed and created all life because dogs, cats and apes and humans all do similar things. We are all mammals. We have varying amounts of hair on our bodies to keep warm. We, we have lungs and we have hearts to breathe. We even see on the slide that we share 60% of our genes with a banana. Notice that on the bottom of that slide it tells us that genes only make up 2% of our human DNA or of our DNA but I'm not going to go into too much detail on DNA today and the human body you'll be glad to hear but that 5% difference in DNA in, equates in our genomes to 150 million units of information so that's a huge difference that 5% is a huge difference in information and code. Yet scientists use information, like we see on the slide, to tell us genetically we are very, very similar to all of those creatures. But actually, we are actually very, very different. We see on this slide that we see the DNA structure of a, a chimp, a human, and a mouse and you can see that they are very very similar especially the chimp and the human but we have seen due to genes and other things like genomes that those very small differences in DNA create some very big physical differences and this is due to the fact that each DNA strand is not just simply turned on or off between different species but rather they can also be turned up and turned down like a volume button on a radio and this also gives us similar traits found in humans and apes one example being that a chimp has a similar brain to a human but it's much smaller so the DNA, DNA similarity is far more complex than simply a percentage and we can see with the, with the fact of the human and the chimp brain that it can be turned up and down. It can be changed in, in variation. Here we see a pig. And it does not share as many physical properties with either chimps or humans, yet still shares 98% of our human genetics. That's only 0.8% less than an ape. But there's a huge difference between an ape and a pig. But again, when we remember that each DNA strand contains 3 billion genomes, we can understand why that pig is so different. The point being that 0.8% difference between a pig and an ape creates an animal that's very, very different. Yet like a pig, a chimp does share some similarities with a human, 
Both pig and chimp share some similar similarities. Although a pig walks on four legs rather than two, pigs, like humans, gain weight easily. They are both susceptible to similar flu viruses. And many of those viruses can be shared between pigs and humans. Organs of a pig are very close in size and make up to a human. So the question we could ask is, does a 0.8 or a 1.2% difference in DNA between humans, chimps and pigs prove that a man evolved from either of these animals? Is DNA sim similar enough to prove that we evolved from either of these creatures? Now at least one scientist on that slide, if you, if you read through it, states that comparing DNA is a little misleading. In fact he claims that that figure of 98% genes between humans and chimps or apes is constantly changing. And I've sourced this, uh, this information from this article from Evolution News. It's not a website as far as I can tell that supports creation or religion but it's one that sensibly questions what scientists say about evolution. And I won't expect you to, to read and understand all that is on the slide. But basically, like the scientist on the previous slide, he claims that using DNA as an evidence of ape-human similarity is actually misleading. He goes on to say that a 1% difference, once again, is made up of 35 billion base pair changes in DNA, 5 million indels and 689 extra genes which are different in humans. Now I don't know what those figures do or what they actually mean but 35 million and 5 million are some very big figures. And the article states that the 1% difference between humans and apes is more likely 6.4% making that similarity between apes and humans less than 94%. In 2018, it was stated that that difference could come down to 85% similarity between apes and humans. But in 2020, it goes back up to 96%. It seems to me that scientists are going backwards and forwards, confusing their, themselves. And that's exactly what our Creator tells us. That man, in his own wisdom, actually goes backwards. The more discoveries he makes, it only leads to more questions. And it is man's wisdom in science where it all starts to go wrong, and where man questions God. At the start of scientific thought, Man's thinking often draws him away from God. And these theories of man's origins or his evolution started way back in Greece 2006 years ago by a man called Anaxim Anaximander. He thought humans could not appear on the earth in their current form due to the fact that human children could not look after themselves while they evolved and they required parenting for many years. Of course his reason is somewhat correct. Human children do have a longer time living with parents than any other animal. But instead of thinking his theory of childcare proved man did not evolve, he instead come up with the idea that while a child was growing and learning to fend for itself, it lived inside a fish. When it then it gave birth to an adult human. What a stupid idea. Fast forward 1,000 years and we have the like of Epidolces who came up with the idea that strange creatures, part human, part animal, who eventually became extinct due to their surroundings. This allowed humans to adapt and survive. And these are very, very similar ideas to, create, to, to evolution today. And he went on to draw all sorts of cre creatures to support his views but he had no scientific proof of those creatures, even to the fact that whether they existed or not. But if you were to look at those drawings, they would have striking similarities to what we see in books 
and films today, fawns, goblins and owls, etc. All things that man creates these days to, to resemble men and animals. Carl Linnaeus perhaps first came up with the idea of creation evolution, which satisfied some church leaders and scientists. It was a way of a form of compromise between evolution and creation. Again, some of these ideas are being still seen today. Next, next came Comte de, Buff de Buffon, who thought all living creatures came from a single source with four legs. James, James Hutton in 1794 came up with the idea of natural selection, still believed today, where a creature evolved due to its habits or its surroundings. Next came this man, Darwin. Not Charles Darwin, but Erasmus Darwin, Charles Darwin's grandfather. He believed, as on the slide, that all animals, as they reproduce, pass down improvements, getting better and better with each child or each youngster. It was clear, however, that he did not know much about human reproduction, as he believed the embryo came purely from the man, a woman simply being a home to the developing baby. He believed all living creatures developed or evolved from plants. And this next man is worthy of a mention. He came up with the theory that the whole solar system came from an exploding nebula. His book was a bestseller and led to the idea of the Big Bang. However, even Charles Darwin did not approve of this book and he described his beliefs as half-baked. So we have seen evolution, we have seen creationism, the Big Bang, natural selection, even monster and human-animal hybrids. Many of these things are taught today in our schools. Many of these ideas are being put in books and taught in our schools. God said, professing themselves to be wise, they become fools. God is not just talking about teachers and scientists. We have become fools for believing these ideas. <coughs> Again, we're not going to go into this in too much detail, but like many scientists, even today, Charles Darwin had a problem. If every living thing on this planet evolved, it must have had a common starting point, a single cell. And not just a simple single cell, but one that must have self-replicated. And this is the problem. Darwin did not even attempt to provide any kind of explanation for a self-replicating single cell. And this was, and still is today, a very important piece of the puzzle. It prompted a significant amount of research by the scientific community to try and create such a single cell organism that can self-replicate self -lubricate, self -replicate. and they haven't come up with much success. Scientists don't have a clue how life began. The article notes in 2011 and even in 2023 the scientific community has failed to discover any plausible explanation that a single cell could ever reproduce itself. Scientists have replicated it, but cannot offer any explanation how it happened on its own. In fact, they are bemused by it. And why would a simple, perfectly good cell ever need to evolve? But scientists have come up with an answer. They reason that the first cell did not simply create self-create or self-reproduce, it was left by aliens. An alien intelligence came to the earth in a spaceship and planted the seeds of life here billions of years ago, then left, it, left us to it. So there was an intelligent creator, but it wasn't God, it was an alien. So who made the alien? Man will believe anything and do anything to disprove God. Charles Darwin in his book, The Origin of the Species, said this, 
It is notorious that man is constrained on the same general type of model as other mammals. All the bones in his skeleton can be compared to corresponding bones in monkeys. So Charles Darwin saw that the skeletons of a human and an ape and an ape or monkeys are very very similar and they are aren't they? Arms, legs, rib cage, spine, pelvis are pretty much identical. And we here see on that slide in the picture they do look very similar. But scientists like Darwin went on to develop the idea that because a human and an ape look similar they could not have been designed. They must have evolved from another, one from another. Two cars, I'm sure you will all agree, look very, very similar. Perhaps just as similar as that monkey and the human skeleton. It's easy to see that both cars have four wheels, two headlights, windscreen wipers, a steering wheel, both have an engine, which in this case both are in the back of the car. If it came down to DNA similarity, we could say that the DNA in those two cars are 95% or even higher. They look very, very similar. Perhaps Charles Darwin would say that they must have evolved. They could not have been designed because they look so similar. Well, I doubt Ferdinand Paul should be pleased with Darwin's theory because he actually designed both of those cars. And both of those cars for their time were designed very, very well. Two similar looking cars, but have two very different roles. And you only realize those design differences when you look under the skin. One of those cars was to be a cheap, practical, five seat, reliable family car that could do 60 mile an hour, eventually. The other was a sports car. It's designed to get to 0 to 60 very, very quickly. It didn't need to be cheap, it didn't need to have five seats either. But both cars could get you to home or to work if you wanted them to, but in very different ways. I'll leave you to decide which is the family car and which is the sports car. Because despite their DNA similarities, it's obvious which one is which. I would say that is a clever designer. A clever designer that's used two very similar creations but with some very clever tweaks made them do two different things. In the engineering world it's called standardization and that's the same with humans and apes. When we look under the surface apes and humans though created very very similar have some very important clever design tweaks. On the top left and the bottom left we see an ape's foot a chimp's foot actually but notice the similarities not with a human foot but with a human hand on the right of the slide we see a human foot and the human foot is very different but very cleverly designed and those diff two different feet make those two creatures do similar but different things now both apes and humans can climb trees can't they but apes having a foot like a hand means he can climb a tree like a sports car whereas a human can climb a tree like a Volkswagen Beetle both apes and humans can walk on two legs but an ape's foot is flat like a hand and his knees are very different to the human knee the human knee is unique and I'd, I'd urge you to look at the human knee when you get some time because it is unique to humans but this means that apes, although they can walk on two legs, can only walk on two legs for very short distances. In fact, humans can do something no other creature can do. They can walk upright for long periods. We are the sports cars when it comes to performing on two legs. We can run, we can run, we can hop, skip and jump. Perhaps all in one movement. And that's all because the differences you can see there on the slide. The human foot has a big toe and a specially designed arch. Now an ape's foot can be used as a hand. And so can a human's. That's not my foot by the way. I don't wear rings on my toes. But with some clever 
determination and adaption, a human can also use his or her foot like a hand, similar to an ape. And although chimp or hand, ape hands may look similar to humans, they are also very different. Brachiation means tree swinging, which humans can do much better than humans. And this is due to the ape's hand having longer fingers. They can wrap round the branch. They can act as an anchor. But human hands, due to a different thumb location, are able to do precise movements, like opening a bottle and many other intricate, intricate things that an ape cannot possibly do. And again on the bottom of the slide, scientists recognise the unique design of the human hand. But do not give the glory to God, but again to evolution. Stating that actually the human hand is more primitive than the ape's hand. One very famous scientist, Isaac Newton, fully understood the importance of the human hand. In fact, he was convinced it was designed by God. Some of you may notice that he states 19 bones in hand. We discovered more recently, of course, that there are actually 27 bones in the human hand. Today, scientists are discovering more about the human body, how that it is wonderfully made, yet still they put those discoveries to evolution rather than a designer. And there's many scientists today Thousands of scientists who are too fearful for coming forward for fear of, of being victimised in the science community for saying that God created man rather than evolution. Next, very briefly, we have the human face. Far more beautiful than, than an ape. I'm sure you'll agree. That's, that's my granddaughter on the slide. But the human face has been designed to be capable of creating thousands of expressions many more than an ape. A human can laugh or cry. We can cry with laughter or we can cry with pain. Cry for our own suffering or cry with another's. We can, we can laugh on our own or laugh with others. How did that evolve? My granddaughter's a teenager now, so she doesn't smile as much as she used to. But what about the, the fossil record? Well, all these apparent missing links from Heidelberg man to Peking man have all, upon further investigation, proven to be a hoax. Lucy, even Lucy, the most recent missing link, is thought to be another dubious source of proof of evolution. Many scientists claim now that it was simply a three-foot chimp, a pygmy chimp. But its bones are locked away from investigation. I would suggest that the reason man and scientists come up with these ideas of what humans descended from or how they looked is due to his own imagination. He finds part of a fossil but in his mind he puts it all together to what fits in to his imagination, what could be possible. Then he seeks to share that knowledge with people who know no better, turning them into fact, bringing them to life in programmes such as on the right of the slide, programmes like Walking with Cavemen. The Word of God is the direct opposite of evolution, isn't it? It tells us that God made each species after their own kind. Yes, they may look similar, but as we have seen, it's quite common even for men to create something that is similar looking to do similar things. Scientists say evolution is a step-by-step -step improvement into something better. So are we evolving into something better? At the time of the flood in Genesis it tells us on the slide that the imagination of man's heart was evil continually. Is the heart or rather the mind of man improving? We may be getting better in technology and research, curing diseases, but is mankind really improving? When we look on the slide, we see drunkenness, we see rioting, drug addicts on the streets, 
children with guns and knives. So is man really improving? Well, it seems to me we, we're not. It seems we enjoy trying to kill or simply harm ourselves in the pursuit of power and pleasure. We can see from that very first picture that humans can act just like apes at times, can't they? Hanging from himself from his legs. And I would say in my lifetime, these things have got worse, not better. Through de deforestation, pollution and overpopulation, all in the desire and the after effects of wealth and greed, man is making this planet much harder to live on. In fact, he is destroying all that God has created. This article is nearly eight years old and humans have produced 6.3 billion tonnes of waste, plastic waste. Much is now in the sea and lots of it are entering our bodies. The article goes on to tell us that by 2050 the oceans will contain more plastic waste than fish. It's a scary thought if you believe in evolution. George Orwell wrote this in his book Animal Farm and in that book these words are spoken by a pig and he's right man is the only living creature on the earth that produces more waste than it consumes. But notice his words he says that man is lord of all the animals We see in Genesis that it was in God's plan for man to have dominion over the rest of creation. But there are two points to remember here. First of all, man was not to have or seek dominion over each other. There was to be no kingdoms of men, only the kingdom of God. Yet since the earliest records, man has sought to conquer Every, nearly every continent of the world and in doing so killing millions. Today man has developed the ability to not only maim children with bombs laced with napalm and to inflict the most terrible suffering. He also has nuclear weapons which could completely destroy the earth. The second point of why man was to have dominion over creation starts with the creation of man. We see then that the first man was made in the likeness and the image of the Elohim, as that word God should read. The word Elohim means mighty ones. It's, it's referring to the angels who are working on God's behalf. And man was created in the same image as them. In other words, man is the same shape or form. Man was also created in the same likeness which points to mental capacity, mental awareness. And this is something that's totally unique to humans. And just as a side note, this mental capacity is quite wonderfully why man create, why God created woman. God saw that man, unlike other creatures, would feel loneliness, that man would create, would desire a companion. So God created him a helpmeet, a woman, who was created again uniquely from a man. This order of creation gave man and woman a unique relationship in creation. No other creature was created this way. This indicated that they were to encourage each other, to support one another, love one another, both physically and mentally. And if we believe in evolution, it's no, wonderful, no wonder that this wonderful union of man and woman is lost today. Perhaps why we see so much divorce in the world and broken families. So man was not created in the same form as an ape. And most importantly, he had something no other animal has, a mind. A thinking process that could give him moral sentiment could give him or her hopes, dreams, but most importantly, a desire to choose to perform the will of God, and more importantly, reflect the character of God. And this is where the second point 
that dominion prospect comes in. Here we see a conversation between a beast of the field and Eve. The serpent tries to reason that if she eats of the tree that Adam and Eve have commanded not to eat of, that they would not actually die. The serpent was not an evil or a possessed being. He just simply did not understand God's commandments. So he challenged it and turned it into a lie. It's not, not what scientists are doing today, challenging God's word and calling it a lie. At first Eve challenged the serpent's thinking, but she gave in. She gave in to the serpent's reasoning and so did Adam. And so they were both now subject to death, just as we are. So Adam and Eve failed to have dominion over that subtlety of the serpent, over his reasoning and over his questioning God's commandments. And so they let the animal or the carnal mind have dominion over them. And so now we also have that thinking process, that carnal mind inherited from our first parents. That desire of animal thinking, the desire to question God, that desire to have power over others, to turn to drinking and behave like animals rather than serve God. And so because of man's disobedience, he has no prominence over a beast. In other words, he has no superiority. We now share something with all creation. We all go to one place, the dust. And scientists have no answer for death. Though they try to make us live longer, there's no cure for death, is there? The Word of God does. Here we see the Lord Jesus Christ speaking about being born again. Being born again of water. He's speaking of baptism where our old lives are put to death. Jesus is telling us that through baptism we put our old lives to death. Our previous life that seeks to disobey, disobey God changes to a new life that serves God. He also speaks of being born of spirit. He's telling us to replace the mind we share with animal thinking to one of spiritual thinking. And the only way we can do that is to fill our minds with the word of God by reading his word continually. If we do that, we shall see the kingdom of God. Here we see what man was designed and created for. To fill the earth with his glory. We can only truly do that if we are changed into something else, into an immortal being. And if we do those things that we read in John chapter 3, if we have dominion over the beast of the field, if we apply our minds to spiritual things, then we have a wonderful hope. Something scientists have no idea of. No more death, no more sorrow, not even crying. For we, God willing, shall have our bodies, these vile bodies, that we are correct in some way, are like animals. They will be changed into glorious and immortal beings. So let us put aside evolution, stop thinking like animals, or even think that we came from animals. But instead, have dominion over ourselves. To have dominion over that animal, that ape that lives inside us, and turn to God and the coming kingdom. Thank you.